Hi guys, thanks for watching. This is Johan um, coming to you from the bottom of Africa. And this is talk number four of my series, which is about social transformation. And if you are new here, I would really encourage you to go back and listen to the first few talks just to get some kind of context about what we're talking. In my previous talk, I spoke a little bit about getting to the root of the problem. And I was using the example of pain and how pain can lead to anger, and anger can, if it is left unchecked and it is undealt with, can often destroy an individual or even a community. And you know, I wanted to talk today about how we need to address hurt and pain, but I went for a long walk up the mountain this morning. We have a wonderful storm, and it occurred to me that there was something else that needed urgent discussion. You know, for years I've been helping victims of abuse. A year in Cape Town, we have got horrendous abuse. And uh, most of the abuse that I deal with has been physical abuse, sexual abuse. Um, sorry to say, but even child rape is becoming more and more common. But there's one type of abuse that always makes my blood boil. And that is the issue of spiritual abuse. Now, we... I think the reason that we have so much spiritual abuse here in South Africa is because South Africa is still a very religious country. If you go anywhere, there's a church on, on most corners. Um, in every town, in every city, you'll find different religions being practiced. We have churches, mosques, temples, whatever, all over the place. And South Africans still hold very dear to their belief um, unlike some Western countries that have kicked God out altogether. Now, I mean, in some, I was just thinking that in some churches, in some communities, we have hundreds of churches even. Um, so in Ocean View, where I've worked for the past 10 years, they tell me there's, there's over 300 churches. And this is in a very small community of just 30,000 people. I, getting back to victims of abuse, <clears throat> you know, when I speak to them, many of them tell me horror stories about what happened back at church when they went forward for help. And, you know, I've heard stories of um, women who were raped, being ostracized by their church, um, women who've been in years of abuse, uh, being told that uh, they may not go to the police or the courts. Um, I've had women have been forced by pastors to withdraw cases that are of abuse at the police station because it made the church look bad, apparently. Um, this is particularly so when it involves prominent uh, church leaders. And, <clears throat> I mean, what's really sad is that almost not a month goes by and there's some story in the newspaper of a pastor that's, that's, that's raped someone in their church. Uh, it is disgusting. And for some reason... People don't want to talk about it. But you know, this has got to stop. It's given the church a bad name. And, and I'm going to talk about it. Okay. When I sit with someone who has been spiritually abused, one of the things that always comes up is they somehow believe that they have failed God. And what happens is they are led to believe that the, the person that has been abusing them spiritually is somehow on an equal par with God, and that by standing up against this abuser, what they've done, in fact, is they've stood up against God, and now God is angry with them. Uh, people get brainwashed like this, and it is very difficult to try and convince them otherwise. And what, what makes it even more challenging, I think, is that the police and the courts don't often understand spiritual abuse. And, and because there's, there's often not much proof, um, it's difficult to, to open up a case and the spiritual abusers are often very clever so what they do is they get the support of many others in the church and uh, often it's the word of the victim versus uh, the word of 10, 15, 20, 30 the whole church and uh, they just feel lost now to the non-Christian watching this you probably are disgusted you should be disgusted because it is disgusting. But I want you to remember that churches are full of people and people are sinful and people do stupid things. 
And I'm not making an excuse now for this. This is just how it is, all right? We are not perfect. We are not as holy as we sometimes like to make people believe that we are. And the Bible also says is that you're going to get wolves among sheep. Now, I've seen my fair share of wolves, and they come, and they're very slick, and they, they make friends, and they, they manage to con an entire church. They do their damage, and before anyone has taken note and caught up, they've gone off to the next church and gone and done their damage there as well. Now, I want to share a story. Many years ago, uh, my colleague and I were walking down the main road. It was a Sunday morning, about half past nine, and there were dozens of people walking to church. And we came across a young couple that was fighting. Well, they were arguing. And the, and the guy was pushing the girl and, and treating her really badly. So my colleague and I went up to them and uh, we tried to engage with them. And while I was talking to the girl, a, a, a group of church people, and I know they were church people because they were wearing fancy suits and had big Bibles under their arms, they came along and one of them said to me in Afrikaans, Rosa eight says Ahur which means, roughly translated, leave her alone, she is a whore. And I, and I discovered that this young girl was a prostitute, uh, a sex worker, and the guy pushing her around was in fact a pimp. And I looked at the girl the moment that that person said that, and her eyes dropped, and she looked deeply humiliated. Now, my friend and I, I mean, this, this, this sunk into my head, and my friend and I spent the next year um, trying to find this girl and we, we, we managed to talk to her several times and we discovered that like so many other South Africans she grew up in the church and like so many prostitutes that I worked with she was forced into prostitution by her so-called boyfriend who turned out to be a pimp and she didn't want to do it and you know at the time a couple of years earlier the church that she was at took note of this and promptly threw her out and rejected her. It was a short time later that her body was found wrapped up in a sheet in the bushes close to you. Now, I always think about how differently God saw her. And I always think about John chapter 8, where a woman is brought to Jesus. He's in the temple. And, and a group of Pharisees bring this woman in who had allegedly been caught in the act of adultery. And the Pharisees say to Jesus, ah, according to the law, she needs to be stoned outside. And they wait for an answer. And Jesus engages with this woman, and in the end he says to her, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more. Jesus showed her mercy. I've lost counts of the number of gangsters and prostitutes and drug dealers and drug addicts and criminals and so-called sinful people who have said to me that when they were at the lowest of the low, when they had hit rock bottom in their lives and they decided they needed help, they dragged themselves to a church only to be told, oh, I'm sorry, you are sinful, you need to go back home, sort your life out and then come back. That does more damage to the person and sends them on a very dark road. And if you are watching this and you have been abused by the church, then I want to, on behalf of Christians, I want to apologize for that. Okay? I please, I need you to understand. Don't make the mistake of believing that that abuser was somehow on par with God. Please don't make the mistake of thinking that because you were called sinful, that somehow God has rejected you. I've also had my fair share of hurt uh, from fellow Christians. It's what happens when you've been for decades in this game. Please, I, I want to encourage you to write to me. My email address is johan at soteriaministries.org.za. It should be in the description below. Thanks for watching and be blessed.